I do realize that I haven't put up the recording for the last, I think, two lectures yet. I will do that. And today we will move on, well, not literally move on from Rust because assignment three is basically all solely based on Rust, but we're gonna <clears throat> dive deeper into, okay, what does it mean to refer to programming, right? And, and I have to be honest here, uh, typically these kind of class requires a full blown one semester. So we will pack it and basically introduce the concepts to you, right? This class, I have to be, really, really precise here. The way you learn this class is similar to the way the Compsys R class is uh, basically designed, right? The Compsys R class is like the gateway to system network and architecture. This class is kind of like the gateway to uh, programming language, compiler, and parallel programming, and actually parallel algorithm if you want to uh, pursue that track as well, right? Anything related to performance from the the, the the language compiler and the program side of side of things, right? <coughs> Sorry. So today we'll cover the basic and the super basic of parallel programming by kind of covering the high level idea of why do we want to do this? And roughly what sort of, sort of program benefit from parallel programming? All right. So the first thing first, we have to kind of discuss the word parallelism, right? The word parallelism kind of means that the, the ability to do multiple things at once, right? Uh, what does it really, it really mean? Let's say you have multiple core, you, when you buy a computer these days, right? It basically is a simultaneous execution of your computation, right? You, you have a four core machine, you have an eight core machine. It means that your program utilize them all. Right, and typically these are good. Basically, it means that when you have all the four processors, each one of them would be, will be doing some useful work that contribute to the finish of your program. So, what does it mean? What does it mean when all the four processors are contributing to something toward the finish of your program? What would be the effects? <coughs> It's faster, right? So let me put it concretely, make it super concrete. In a program, that's this thing called instruction, right? Basically, these are assembly code, right? Each line represents one instruction. Each line in assembly represents one instruction. So let's say I have a program, right? Oops. I have a program, right? That has, say, 4 million instruction, right? This is likely a program that would run for like less than one second. Surprise! <laughs> within one second, within one second, you can you are, actually your computer is capable of running. I would say up to likely like ten, ten thousand, close to that number of instructions, right? Ten thousand million, ten thousand million. So for millions, like just a tiny bit of time, a right? tiny bit of your time. So let's say I have to finish 4 million instructions. If I have one processor, that whole processor is responsible for running all 4 million, right? So what if I have four processor? And for the sake of assumption, my program is fully paralyzed. Everyone can take any of this instruction, they can run and they would run fine. So in this case, each processor is responsible for roughly how many instructions? <clears throat> one million, right? So it's yeah, one million instructions roughly. Assuming that you do load balancing, everything is perfect. Now it's perfect world, right? So let me let me compare two two types of processor. So, Let's say I can buy one giant processor, so one processor at say six gigahertz versus four processor with three gigahertz, right? This one processor, if I want to run this program, I need to run four million instruction. But if I have four processor, each one of them would run one million each, right? 
So which one are going to be faster? If I run this program, what would be my expectation in the ideal case? In the ideal case, let's say each instruction takes one unit of time. In this case, which setup do I do I want it to be? Right? Do I want to run it on full processor that are slower? Yeah, of course. You want to run it on a full processor that are slower because in that case, in the ideal world, right, each processor run one million instructions. That's gonna be faster than another processor that are more powerful. Let's say it just go fast, like double the speed, six gigahertz, which by the way it doesn't always translate to double the speed, right? But with this processor, I would run four million instruction at about in the ideal case, maybe around like two x slower, right? With this, with this. And this is basically simultaneous execution of computation, right? Somehow my program is much faster and believe it or not, believe it or not, this one processor with six gigahertz is likely to cost more <laughs> for you. Basically you have to spend a lot more money to buy that processor because it, it actually take a lot of design complexity to, to make it six gigahertz, right? So, a cheaper for processor that a wimpy and a more powerful like my slow. Yeah, sorry. If something loud, if you hear something loud, oh, this this with my cat. Uh, yep, trying to destroy my another uh, working chair. Yep, give me one second. Okay, I'm um, back, and I think I saved my chair. <laughs> another thing is. Because these days, like these days, you run Windows, right? In the Windows, how many programs are you running at the same time? A lot. Yeah, a lot, right? These days, you, you are it at the liberty of just double click, launch your program, and doesn't, do you actually feel that things are actually slow down? Let's say you open Microsoft Word, Excel. PDF reader, like many of these light uh, office kind of application, you just, you can open as many of them, right? Do you ever feel like things are slowing down? <clears throat> does it, does it behave like things are slowing down? No, right? Yeah, for, for these simple pro, well, not simple, but like this, office related program then they're not really slowing your computer down you can run like 10 of them and your computer would be fine right uh it, it's bad to get slow when you run something uh intensive like playing games uh processing video process processing uh, uh i don't know like this is a garage band to process a lot of uh input audio signal right and so this, this doesn't have to be can, it doesn't have to be related, but they can be related. It can be from one single program, right? Uh, for example, if you buy Photoshop, right? Photoshop actually utilizes multiple threads to process this image, right? So each of the processors are gonna work together, right, to to process your data. And a quick warning about this particular slide, um, not not particular lecture. Some of these will be in C++, but I'll explain the code to make sure you can understand it. At the end of the day, parallelism is powerful. So what's our big assumption so far? What has been our big assumption so far? I say, hey, multi-core is good. Parallelism is good. <clears throat> yeah. Our, right now, our big assumption is somehow this can be done in parallel, which is a huge assumption, right? It is a huge assumption. So you all take the DSOP class before, right? And are you familiar? Are you familiar with like basically in order traversal in a tree? So what about if I ask you to make that done in parallel? Is it is it simple as in like can you just take the current algorithm 
and somehow assign, okay, this process do this part, this process do that part. Is it that simple? So let's assume I have a magic black box that can assign work to each processor. From the algorithm point of view, right, from the algorithm of in order traversal, can I even do that? Mm, it's not that simple, right? You need to think, okay, if I assign, so let's say I have a tree that looks like this, right? It's a tree I'm doing in order traversal, right? And let's say right now, processor one is here. And let's say I want to assign tasks, right? Which part do I want processor two to, to do? And how do I merge, right? Let's say I, I finish my part. How do I merge them all, right? So it's not easy in a sense that sometimes you have to think about, okay, how do I assign these jobs? And how do you merge them all, right? How do you merge them all? And that's the beauty of making things parallel, basically. It's a beauty and it's a pain at the same time. Um, it, it's the same. So, so analogy, of the, a good analogy of this, I would like to think of like, let's say you have to run a big company, right? You have to run a big company and you are the CEO. You are the CEO. Is it possible that you can run the entire company with no manager? That's a great idea, actually. Like, what if you traverse from the bottom, right? From the bottom left. But, okay, let me ask you this question. If you know you have to travel from the bottom left, right? How many things can travel from the bottom left at the same time and you will still produce useful results? Because they're gonna do the same task, right? Which means that well, I'm gonna the second second processor will do the same thing as the first processor because they are starting from the bottom left, right? So yeah, so that that's why you have to think about oh, okay, can I can I delegate the work, right? So in real life, in the in the work setting, who is that guy who delegate all the work to workers? i.e. the processor. So have you heard of the, 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 uh, basically the, the manager trap, like the project manager, uh, the, well, the team lead, uh, these guys who coordinate, who get to do what in a project. It's the same thing, right? First of all, you need to figure out, okay, how do I divide the task so that it's all efficient, right? And we're gonna talk about the context of like the, the real life manager versus the, the context of the program because I find that there's a lot of things in common, right? There's a lot of things in common. And the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the concept of concurrency, right? Concurrency is basically handling multiple things at once, right? Uh, the thing that computer do concurrently should be independent from each other, right? Uh, think of it this way. Let's say concurrency is basically as a process of truly running things independently in the hardware level. So hardware concurrency, hardware concurrency means that I get to run them in parallel. Sometimes when you talk to software people, the, when you said concurrency, they don't mean hardware concurrency. Sometimes they mean that, well, I can have multiple tasks that can be done in parallel. I don't guarantee if that can be done in parallel. But in terms of hardware concurrency, this is a process of truly running things independently on a hardware level, right? So, so this is basically, I enable everything to go and run at the same time. All right. So the other thing I have to tell you that it actually has a lot to do with parallelism is remember our old friend Dataflow, the first lecture. Yeah, I kind of forgot. I, I forgot a Dataflow question on the exam. Maybe I should put it. Uh, maybe next time I teach the class. But 
the concept of data dependency ties to data flow and the, the definition of data dependency is let's say I have a function, right? Let's say I have a function, but the input depends on the results of other function. Why is this bad for parallelism? So why is this bad? Why is data dependency can be bad in some cases? It's sequential. Right? Sequential means that I just finished task A before I finish task B. Right? So you have to wait. It's basically a lot of waiting game, right? So if you want to run uh, a, a well-run company, right? So if I have a parallel task and I have 10 worker, basically 10 employee, right? I can assign each employee with one task and they can do all in parallel. But let's say I have data dependency. Let's say I have data dependency. It means that my second worker, the second employee, have to wait for the first employee to finish his task, right? To finish his task before you can start your own task. So that can be a little bit, basically your throughput will decrease, right? The amount of work you can do will go down, right? So data dependency is something that can, right? It doesn't always be that case. It can reduce your parallelism. So let, let me go through one example, right? Uh, it's called parallel for loop. In C, you can use silk. And to be honest, to be honest, silk is no longer supported with the, the modern library. Uh, Intel kind of dropped that support. So it, it, right now you either use OpenMP, right? Which I'm going to show you the code. And here's the loop. Forget about the silk for, just think of it as a for loop, a normal for loop. For the, what does this do? What does the loop, loop do? So can one, someone guess what is the code doing? Yes. So basically increment the value of array A by one, store them in B. So basically B is A plus one, right? Every element of B is that same element of A, but add one to it. Is this code, does this code have any at all, like any dependency? Can I start loop number 10 along with loop number 20, along with loop number 21? So does the question is does B of I dependent on any previous element of B? Question mark. If I want to compute B of I. You don't need B of I minus one, right? As long as A of I is ready, you can run it right away. So the only thing that this whole B is dependent on is, do I finish computing A? Do I have the data available? And in most case, yeah. So if N is 1 million, if N is 1 million, it means that this loop that go around 1 million times can be done all in parallel, right? So this silk library, uh, basically when you, instead of writing four, you write silk four. Silk four will do the loop in parallel. So let's say you have eight processors, out eight of them, the first processor would do B of zero, the second processor would do B of one, the seventh processor would do the B of uh, six, and the eighth processor would do B of seven. And when they are done, they will be assigned B of 8, 9, 10, 11. They can be done all in parallel. So some of you might have heard of the, this thing called OpenMP. Uh, this is similar. 
OpenMP is another great library that you can use. It's a framework that allows you to parallelize your code. They are kind of built for C and C++, right? So instead of this, you instead of using Silk, right, you replace it with this pound pragma. In the language C++, when you do pound pragma, it means that I'm giving the compiler a hint, right? Basically, this has nothing to do with the assembly, but it's giving the compiler a hint that say, hey, hey, look at this loop. Look at this loop. This loop should be mapped to OpenMP parallel 4. Open OpenMP parallel 4. So it will check, okay, how do I implement this loop in parallel? OpenMP framework would then assign and manage all this running of the loop so now because there's no dependency you can all run the loop in parallel so any questions so far any questions so far so if you actually want to test this make sure you install openmp on the machine that you want to run it on same here you make sure you install silk but for Silk, it might be a little bit tougher because it might require the older version of your Linux. <laughs> so because it is not no longer supported. So yes, yeah. So the question is, does this really auto assign what gets to run on what processor? Yes. I mean, to be honest, by default, the operating system would do that assignment. But OpenMP work with the runtime as well as the compiler to basically say, hey, hey, this loop has been annotated by the programmer that say, hey, this can be run in parallel, so let's run it in parallel, right? This is similar to the, the parallel iteration in Rust, right? Basically, from the programmer, we tell the runtime. Runtime, think of runtime as the manager that manage everything you're running. It tells the runtime, it tells the compiler that, hey, this can be run in parallel, so please do that because it's gonna make things faster, right? All right, so any questions so far before we move on? So I'm gonna teach you about the next element of parallel program called fork join. Fork join. What is a fork in, in English language? I doesn't mean utensil, but what, what is a fork? Let's say you are walking along a path, right? If you see a fork, it means you see a split in road, right? So it means literally that. You run a program. A fork means that you run two different functions. Right, A, double vertical bar B, it means that A and B can be run in parallel, right? So I'm gonna guess what you think and what you might answer, but give me one simple function that has this fork join uh, property that we've been using a lot. So what function call another two functions and later do something with the result of those functions? All right, how about Fibonacci? Can I run fifth of n minus one along with fifth and my uh, fifth of n minus two? Can I do that? Can I do this actually? Can I run Fibonacci in parallel? Is that a yes or is that a no? Yeah, right. So fifth of n minus one is a totally separate computation from fifth of n minus two, right? So in in Rust in Rust we can use rayon which what we established last time is a parallel uh parallel library that gives you a lot of apis that you can call 
And one other thing you can do is called rayon join. Rayon join. Join mean that I'm gonna wait for these two results. I'm gonna wait for these two results. And then when I do this double vertical sign, it means that whatever I go into this join function, run them in parallel because I already marked that they can be run in parallel. So when you put in those double vertical sign, it means that fifth of n minus one. And fifth of n minus two can be done in parallel. It right, can be done in parallel. Once the results come back, pattern matching, so x will have what? Which one store fifth of n minus one? Which one would store fifth of n minus two with this pattern matching? X is going to be fifth of n minus one, and Y is going to be fifth of n minus two. No, that cat tree is not your ninja warrior course. Don't do that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, then my cat is. Did he sneak in and drink my coffee? Maybe. Uh, yeah. So I don't know why they are high right now. Uh, sorry about that. So basically now X is going to store fifth of n minus one, Y is fifth of n minus two. So when you join, you know that I'm just gonna return X plus Y, right? I'm just gonna return X plus Y. So how does this look like in data flow? This is gonna look something like this. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go down to the plus and minus. I'm just gonna stick with function call, right? So I have N coming in. Basically you have fifth of N, right? which will then be fifth of n minus one, fifth of n minus two, right? Which will compute fifth of n minus two and n minus three, right? This will be fifth again of n minus four, oh no, my bad, three, and fifth of n minus four all these things, right? And then it will merge back. At the end of the day, they're gonna merge back by adding the result, right? Right, to get your uh, data back. What are the inefficiency in this whole thing? So anyone want to guess, like for the Fibonacci in general, what 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 is the inefficiency here? Yeah, uh, right now we compute n minus three twice. I'm gonna compute n minus four more than twice, right? I'm gonna compute these a lot. Like there's a lot of repeated computation. So sometimes it might be worthwhile to do dynamic programming along with it. So one thing you can try is to write, try to run this in parallel and try to compare the performance of this parallel implementation with a simple dynamic programming Fibonacci. So anyone here know how to implement Fibonacci using dynamic programming without the flip of n minus one, flip of n minus two? Basically using a loop, like one single loop do that. Anyone? Oh, dynamic programming. So if you haven't taken algorithm before, Dynamic programming, uh, okay, sorry, side topic. I, I want to briefly talk about the terminology that I use, which I'm sorry, I thought I thought we all covered that. I'm sorry for 63 students, there's a high chance you haven't taken algorithm yet. But dynamic programming is you store the result out of function so that if you need to use it in the future, you don't call the function again, which perfectly works for this context, right? Because if I first compute fifth of zero, right, and then compute fifth of one with dynamic programming, how do I compute fifth of two? I look up what fifth of zero, what fifth of one, I add them, this is fifth of two, right? What's the fifth of three? I'm gonna just add these two numbers to get two. <laughs> it's okay, sorry. Uh, eventually, I'm sure you can take it and you have a lot of fun uh, with that in that class, especially if you like math and thinking that class is awesome. Uh, not 
just Justin, there's a there's a reason why I go into computer system and architecture and doesn't really touch the theory part. <laughs> I'm in your shoe. <laughs> yeah, so so it cannot sometimes if you like maths, right? It can be fun. If you don't like it, it can be grueling, but still enjoyable, right? Hopefully. So FIPA four can be computed by adding FIPA two and FIPA three, which you already run, right? So you add a two number five, you add the two number previously eight, you add the two number previously thirteen, right? So with dynamic programming, how many times do you have to compute say FIPA of n minus four? Once, right? You only have to call it once, and that's all, right? And you might not be surprised by now, but sometimes, sometimes with algorithm changes, like using dynamic programming for with Fibonacci, it can even be faster than running this in parallel, than running this in parallel. So it depends on how you want to make your program fast. In many cases, if you know that changing the algorithm make it fast, making it parallel make it fast, so anyone wants to take a guess that how can we make the best of both worlds? Your thoughts? Yes. There's an area, right, that kind of spawned from the merging of algorithm and parallel programming called parallel algorithm and i would definitely recommend talk to adan Kanat about it because he's a world expert on this area he's one of the only like handful of people who who is expert in this area like parallel algorithm is his his toy basically so so definitely recommend uh if especially if you love algorithm right? if you don't like algorithm too much Maybe stick with computer system. There's also so many open end questions that you have to seek answer and engineer uh, the solution. The other thing aside fork join is what we call nested parallelism. So we've seen two forms of parallelism: parallel for loop and fork join, right? So you can loop and run things in parallel. You can spawn another function call and run things in parallel, right? Nested parallelism is let's say you have a loop that has a function call in them, right? I have a loop that has a function call in them. So can I utilize both of them? Can I run the loop in parallel and do the fork join inside the loop? Yes, no. So that's nested parallelism basically. You can run parallel for loop inside a fork join. You can fork join and you see a loop. Okay, I'll run it, it, that in parallel. There was an older version of OpenMP. OpenMP is like a really, really super popular uh, framework for parallelism, right? Uh, the older version of OpenMP doesn't really support nested parallelism, but Rust, actually Rust have that support. I think the recent version of OpenMP also support nested parallelism now. Uh, I'm not sure how efficient they are compared to Rust, so I haven't really do a full blown like proper analysis on which one is faster. Uh, if you want, you can do that for, a, for uh, as your project too. Basically, have a few codes that run in OpenMP and Rust and see which one is faster. Right, that is a totally legit project idea. Uh, and in in those kind of project, uh, I would recommend. Take codes that are already optimized by people who implement it. And if you want, you can implement your own code as well. That's totally okay. But let's let me look at let let everyone look at this particular diagram. Right? Let me let let us look at this particular fork join diagram. So this is a fork join diagram. What's the maximum concurrent computation that we can get out of this parallel task? Let's assume each of these. Circle is the computation, like function call, right? So how how much, how what's the maximum parallel things we can do with this task graph, with this dependency graph? Dependency graph means that when I have an arrow like this, 
task one has to finish before task two. So what's the maximum things I can do in parallel? Seven, right? And because the, the way I draw this would help, right? You can circle this cut in a graph and you see, hey, there's a seven dots here, right? The formal definition is two tasks are parallel if there's no path, no path between that two tasks. So if you look at this node and this node, can I go from node A to node B with this graph? Is there a path for me for me to go from A to B? No, right? It kind of means that A and B has no data dependency. I can run A, I can run B at the same time. Who cares? They don't need the other data, right? The fact that there is a path, when there's a path, it means that someone is producing the data for the other guy, right? Okay, so are you with me so far? I'm gonna move on to the cost analysis, cost analysis. Now let's analyze, is it worthwhile to do parallel programming for certain program? This is, this is one of the key things for you to actually decide, should I paralyze this code or will I ended up wasting like three days of my life and it's not gonna be even faster. So that's the concept of the work. What is work in general, right? Let's say I, have, I give you an assignment. How can you define work? Number of tasks, right? So basically, work is in in this context is number of operations. How many add, multiply, loading the data, doing each instruction? How much work do you have to do? And that depends on the entire program. Basically, this program, this task, like how much operate, how many operations you have to do. Depth is longest chain of dependency. Basically. It's the longest path from the beginning to the end. So sometimes we call this a span, right? So parallelism is work divided by depth. Is work divided by depth. Why is this a good way to measure parallelism? So let's say I have a, a graph that looks kind of like this, right? Each circle here is work. So what's the depth here? What's the depth of this uh, operation graph? Yeah, it's five, right? And work is basically tally all these dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right? So what's the parallelism? Around two, right? So you get around two parallelism, right? So parallelism kind of means what does it mean? It means that it's the number of processor that can be effectively used. So with this, with this, you can see that the maximum parallelism is at the roughly four, right, which is around there. But this particular program would be basically uh, at at the maximum throughput slash how fast it can be at two processors. Right? Remember Amdahl's law. MDAO law very to say that if you want to paralyze your program and if you want to buy multi-core processor, right? You want to buy multi-core processor, will that processor benefit? Let's say you have four core processor, will that processor benefit from any program with parallelism of two?
So does it, do you want to spend that much money? If you know that your paralysis is not that high. Nope. That's correct. Right. Uh, the, there's a, there's a lot of lingering question here then, right? Because if you know the program, you somehow know that, let's say I have a mobile phone and I know that my mobile phone, the workload, the, the way they are designed, is a bunch of single thread program. It's a bunch of single threaded program. It means that you are not going to paralyze the program by a lot, right? Do I need my mobile phone to be multi-core? Or can I just go by with a single core? The answer is might be more effective to use a single core, but faster processor, right? So that's why, right? Uh, if you, my, one of my gut feeling of this, there was a generation of iPhone, right? That is single core. It's been single core for a long time. And everyone is like, why don't you have multi-core design, right? on an iPhone versus Android, which by that generation of our Qualcomm already came up with like four core uh, processor, right? But the thing is in Android, everything is multi-threaded. Everything in Android is a threat, a separate threat. So having multi-core there makes sense, right? It makes a lot of sense. It might not, the thing is that they never published the data, right? But it might not be as making much sense to spend the money to have multi-core, but rather make that single core a lot faster too, right? What else? So the lingering question for a hardware person like me, right, is, well, if I have multiple core, let's say I have an eight core processor and I know my program will never use more than two, should I buy that processor? So what do we do with the CPU that they're doing nothing? So any, any, anyone want to take a stab at this question? Run out of program. Perfect. That's what I'm looking for. All right, so basically, yeah, you can buy four core CPU and then you can run five programs, six programs, it's fine. Uh, anyone here heard of the word turbo boost? Anyone here heard of this? Anyone know what exactly what's happening here? So what does Turbo Boost do? So what, what does the... Ah, yes, Justin, you get it right. Basically, well, it's sometimes it's not even underclocking other core. What's happening if they turn off the other core, right? So let's say I detect that this program demands speed, but I'm running on only one core, right? I, it's a single threaded program that doesn't really take advantage of the other core at all. From the hardware point of view, do I need to power on the other three core? No, <laughs> I just power it off and overclock the first core. Basically make the speed much higher. Right? That allows you to basically run single threaded program faster. So if you see the terminology turbo boost, that's what it means. It doesn't mean that all the processor would be that fast. Well, let's say I have a 3.3 gigahertz processor that can be turbo boost to five gigahertz. It means that if I have only thing running on your machine and it use only one CPU, that CPU can be turbo boost to five gigahertz. It's not that all four would be turbo boost to five gigahertz, but yeah. Sometimes when you have single threaded program, you can make it fast too, to through like hardware uh, changes, right? So let's go now, let's go to some example and we do cost analysis. So what is the work and what's the depth here? 
sorry for uh, going a little bit out of context quite a bit earlier because basically right now I'm trying to teach how to get work and how to get depth, right? So what work? This is sequential sum, right? I go through my vector, I add every number in there. So what's the amount of work? Let's assume that one unit of work is one add. So, and I have N, the, the vector size is N. So what work? It's length minus one, right? Basically, if you take algorithm, right? If you take the algorithm, one thing you can do is that this is O of, o of N. So the way, so for those who haven't checked algorithms so far, uh, the big O notation, the big O notation means that I'm going to look at the worst case analysis, the worst thing that can happen to this program, right? Worst thing that happened to this program. Then I'm going to write out the number of operations. So let's say the number of operations is N plus 10, right? N plus 10. I'm going to look at the part that has the highest factor, which is right now n, right? I would say O of n. But let's say the operation has to be n to the 3 plus n to the 2 plus 20, right? In this case, in this case, this is, let's say this is the worst case number of operations. The big O notation is basically you look at this n to the 3, right? Because that that has the most factor into the runtime of your program. And you say, hey, that's O of N to the three, right? This applies to any types of input N, right? So let's say you have three N to the four plus N to the two plus 20. Now your big O notation is the O of N to the four. Right, so to answer your question, is worth the duration of the loop? Yes, basically the number, of, well, not duration, but the number of operations that you have to do for the whole thing. So this this particular code, the whole thing is that loop. And the only thing you do in the loop is adding, 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 right? So that's the word. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. So what if your work, what if your number of operations is two to the n, plus n to the two plus 25. So what's the big O notation of work here? Which one grow faster? Is it two to the 10 or n to the two? Yeah, so basically now it's O two to the n, right? This thing is polynomial. It means that the work is mappable to a polynomial function. This is non-polynomial. or basically exponential, right? It's non-polynomial. So it means that the work that you have to do for two to the n is non-polynomial. It's slow, it's really, really slow, right? That's why you heard about this thing called a, a p equals np. If polynomial means, like, is it possible to come up with an algorithm that solves non-polynomial function in polynomial time? And that question never have answered, <laughs> actually. Uh, I'm not the algorithm guy. Uh, I'm not up to date in the frontier research in algorithm, but double check with that Dan Kanat, he's the guy who, if you have these kind of questions, make sure you check with him. So that's work, that's work, right? So I'm gonna erase everything here and just focus on what's the work here is O of N. All right, done with the recap on big O notation. So what's depth? How far do you have to go here for the for the sequential sum? Hint is sequential. So what would be our depth? I have n operations. How long do I go from the start? Yeah, it's all n. Right. Awesome. So what's our parallelism? Work over depth, that's one, right? 
Okay, so let's go to the next example, parallel sum, parallel sum. What is work and what is that? I'm going to leave you to these two questions for two minutes. I'm going to sort out my cat. I think it is open an arena on my working chair. I want to make sure they stop that. So I'll be right back. All right. Uh, I'll give everyone two minutes to, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, recursion is parallel thumb and it draw it out on how this swap out and you get the answer. So what is work and what is depth, right? So I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I need to sort out my cat. They are fighting. All right, awesome. Uh, so work is O of N and depth is O of log N, right? So everyone got that? Oh, double check, can you hear me? All right. So yeah, work is O of N, right? It's the same thing. You have to do the same amount of addition. So that's O of N. And as you can see from here, you do fork join, basically you fork it out, right? So this is O of log of N, right? So this parallelism is N over log N. So that's the answer to our question, what's work and what's depth? And, oh, uh, so if you're not sure how to find D, right? When you draw the, the, the graph out, depth is the depth of that graph. Over here is the depth of the tree, right? So basically, if you draw this out, you know that it go, it's a binary tree, right? Every time, every time you branch out, you branch into two sides, right? So that's basically log of n. n is the amount of things you have to do. n is the amount of thing you have to do. If you have to go and fork out uh, this task, so this in total, this whole thing is n. In total, this whole thing is n, right? You need you need to go down this step how many times let's say you have to go down d right d time d what's the relationship between d and n 
d is the height of our tree, n is the total number of this circle inside the tree. What's the relationship between d and n? Two to the d, I guess minus one, okay. equal n. Is that roughly correct? If you assume it's balanced tree on both sides, this is going to be two to the d minus one equals n, right? You can check that by counting. You can check that by how it branch out. Every time you grow twice, the earlier level, like the level, the first level grow twice from the zero level. The second level goes twice. There are twice number of nodes from the earlier level. There are two nodes here, four nodes here, eight nodes here. So every time you grow up, it's twice the number, right? So how can I calculate these? How can I solve for D in this case? D is our depth, right? So how can I solve for D? What function do I apply to get D? Let me solve this a little bit. So it's two to the D equals N plus one, right? How can I get D? Log two, right? So you apply log two of two to the D on both sides. What do you get? Log two of two to the D is D. Log of n plus one is or log n, basically, right? So good. We now have the solution. That is log of n. So now you might be wondering, this is approximation, right? It's not the real parallelism that you, you can do. For example, if you go back to this diagram, right, this particular tree, right? There are times when you can run more than two things, but your parallelism is roughly two, right? So you might be wondering why this is good. The first thing I'll tell you, this is simple. <laughs> Draw the graph, you get the work, and you get the depth, right? There's also a theorem called Brent theorem, where let's say you have P processor, let's say you buy P processor four core, eight core, your program can be scheduled in O of work over P plus depth time. This is how long, how long it would take to run the program, right? Assuming that the on, that's the only program you run, that's a big assumption, but assuming that that's the only program running on the system, don't fight with me, please. At least on like scratch my feet, it hurts. Uh, so Brent's theorem tells us that if that's the only thing you run on the program, and it can be scheduled and run in O of work over P plus D on P processor on P processor. This is basically follow Amdahl's law again, right? That's why I brought in Amdahl's law way in the beginning because. That tells you how much efficiency you're going to get out of the hardware. Lower bound is this. Lower bound is telling you how much time, how much time do we need if we have P processor, if we have P processor. So over here, right, over here, if I have P processor with the work of W, with the depth of D, right? Work, depth, number of processor. The reason I'm smiling is, is this particular equation is hinting at something. It's hinting at something. What determines D? What, how can we calculate D?
D basically is determined by how sequential is your program, right? If your program is totally sequential, for this equation, which one will dominate? Which one will dominate? Is it the W over P or is it the D? Which side dominate? D, right? D would dominate if it's a sequential program. If I have a lot of pro my bad. So let's say I buy like 1000 processor, like I have 1000 core processor. I have 1000 cores, right? W over P is W over 1000, right? In that case, if you have a sequential program, D will dominate because that's the longest part of your program. This particular equation tells you if I have this algorithm, do I need to run on how many core? How can I balance out the work and the depth of my algorithm? As well as balance out how many core do I want to schedule, right? There are many, many times where I've seen people in this country and everywhere. Let's say I have a cluster of machines, like a HPC cluster. It's a supercomputer, basically. Supercomputer typically contain hundreds and hundreds of CPU for you to allocate and use, right? I've seen so many cases where a user say, okay, I want to use, oh, so is that, also the question is, can depth be graded and work? Uh, no, work is going to be graded and depth. The problem here is our left side is not work alone. It's work over the number of processors. Right, work over the number of processor that tells you what's the potential benefit of if I have fully paralyzed program that's the O of W over P. I can finish my program by dividing W over P. But if my program is super sequential, buying multi core processor will not help you. Will not help you. And the reason why this is important is let's say you have a supercomputer with multiple core. Right, with multiple core. You want to use 70, let's say 64 core to run your program, but your program only have such parallelism. So basically the depth is equal to work. In that case, you're not gonna use all 64 core. You only use one, right? You only use one. So you're gonna end up underutilizing your computer, right? So when you design a parallel algorithm, typically, typically a work efficient program would be roughly, right, roughly the same as sequential running time. So this sentence, this whole thing, what it means is, what it means is, don't add extra work. <laughs> don't add extra work. It should roughly be the same as the sequential running time. And a parallelism of square root of n. So this is basically O of root n or parallelism is considered good. So this is basically a rough idea. If you get O of root n for parallelism, awesome, right? Any questions so far? Before we go through more examples. So let's go through uh, not a really good quick sort here. Okay. So what did this do? So a quick sort. I forgot. <laughs> you haven't taken the algorithm class yet. Uh, how many of you are not familiar with quick sort? Oh, you did in a DSOP. Okay, awesome. So we all know quick sort to some extent. Yay. All right, I was about to spread on myself and forgot about some of you might not have heard of quick sort. So basically, what does quick sort do? Uh, take a look at F0, F1, and F2, right? What are these?
you partition the list, right? S0 is everything that's lower than our pivot. S1 is whatever is equal to our pivot. And S2 is whatever is greater than our pivot. And I'm actually not even sure how to pronounce the word pivot. I've seen these pronounced in five different ways, including when I was in the US. <laughs> so sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly. I still don't know. Maybe I should actually find it out. Uh, but anyway, so S0 is anything that's slower. S1 is the equal value. S2 is the greater value, right? And what you have to do next is stop my cat from chewing my tissue paper. But, huh? Yeah, tomato, tomato, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce the word pivot. Uh, yeah, so so what do we do next after I take the, the, the tissue box from my cat is basically I will need to do a quick sort on S0 and S2, right? And then I'm going to put them after each other because it, they're going to be sorted. So is this done in parallel? The answer is yes. I just tell the program to call QS quicksort on S0 and S2 in parallel, in parallel, right? So what's work here? And long end, right? You kind of have to go two sides. Uh, each time you split in half, and you will do the sorting, right? So consider this example. This is kind of like, I wouldn't say it's a bad parallel program. It's not as efficient as what it could have been, right? So what if my partitioning, basically the part that I break things in half, and the part I merge, right? The part I split things in half, and the part I merge. That's uh, splitting is O of n, merging is log n, right? I'm not talking about the comparison part. Basically, now it's just splitting, merging, split, split, splitting, merging, splitting, merging, right? But my call is still running recursive, uh, serially, right? Serially. So the hint here, and this is basically my homework to you for now, we will talk about this in the next lecture because I want you to think about this a little bit more, right? Right now, if you consider the sorting part, right? So this is the splitting partition and uh, merging, right? And each time you have to partition, each time you have to partition, how many, how much work you have to do per partition? So each level, how many, yes, O of N, right? So the uh, comparison plus going through the list that's n, right? Each level is also n. So in theory, in theory, well, work is likely to be n log n, right? Because you think that, hey, I'm, I'm going to split into two half. Each, each level is n, right? But you forgot about each level is n. You split into two half. But when you need to break this out and inward again, you have n number of nodes n number of nodes, right? And the resulting is not going to be very good because, right, partitioning and appending, which let, let me highlight that part. Oh, here, right? 
So here's the complexity of our sort earlier. Partition, which means that we're going to break, break things apart. Append is when you have to read things and, and basically put the S sorted S zero here, the middle part here, and the sorted S two right here, right? That uh, sequential leads up. Sequential partition and sequential uh, appending, right? So your span or your depth is O of n. Your span is O of n. Right now your work is n log n, but because this has to be done sequentially, your depth, your depth is the entire list. Your depth is entire list. So your parallelism is O of log n. Right, all of block n. Is lock n greater or less than root of n? Which one grow faster? Oh, which, which one? Yeah, which one grow faster? Square root of n or lock of n? So let's say, yeah, at square root of n is faster, definitely. And the, if you want to check, put in million for both sides, right? Million for both sides. Lock of 1 million is around 20. How can I, anyone want to take a guess of how can I tell what is lock of 1 million really quickly? Well, because I know that 2 to the 10 is 1024, that's one, basically one, uh, one kilobyte. So when I do the conversion between kilobyte, megabyte, I know that's 2 to the 10. So I know 2 to the 20 is roughly 1 million. Okay, so that's around 20. So what's the square root of 1 million? What two numbers multiply with each other and get uh, 1 million? 1,000, right? So 1,000 is definitely much, much higher than 20. So our parallelism is not good enough. Parallelism of log n is, is eh, it's okay. It's not great, right? How can we make it faster, right? So in terms of the zero portion, the zero portion, as I said, there's a partitioning and concatenation. Again, the part where we split and merge. Can be done in O of n work and lock n of depth. But the call is made serially here, right? If you look at this, the call right here is done one after another. Basically, what it means, I'm going to use a different color, which because it might sound confusing. When can I know this call can happen? When can I know this call, this fork can happen? I have to finish the partitioning, right? I have to finish partition this whole thing before I can fork. I have to finish partitioning this whole block before I can fork. Again, this whole block before I, before I can fork again, right? So that becomes the bottleneck. That becomes the serial portion of the code. That's why I put it here, right? The recent the calls the calls are making done one after another. You have to fork, wait, fork, wait, fork, wait. So the complexity here is work of n log n, depth of n, parallelism of still log n. If you break, right, if you break this call. You see that, well, the work is O of n log n, the problem is O of log n, right? The span over here of this call is done n times. It's done n times. That's why it's not very good, right? So let's make this faster. Right? Let's make this faster. So anyone have a question so far?
The reason, okay, let, let me tell you one more thing. The reason why this is span of O of n is earlier you have this parallel side that fork into a smaller block, right? This is A, this is B, C, D, e, F, and G, right? If I map back to this diagram, this is A, this is B, and B, fork into B and C, B and C. D and E is done here because it's the, the B side. And then F and G is done here. The reason why it's done this way is because, because the call, the call, even though you put in double bar that say, hey, this can be done parallel, they're actually being done serially because because you have to wait for the partitioning and concatenation. So how can we make them done in parallel, right? Basically, we want to change this to recursive calls are made in parallel, something that looks like this, right? Something that looks like this. The span, when you have to actually look at the entire thing, this small fraction, which actually do the sorting. How can I sort in parallel? Remember our sequential sum? So is it possible that I can parallelize the, the partitioning part? Can I parallelize the partitioning part? The one that say S0, goes to anything that's less than E, S1 is equal to P, and S2 is greater than P. You can, right? Basically, make sure you do that too. When you do that, when you do that, you then realize that the depth here is actually lock up n. You can do this in parallel using fork join again, right? So the span becomes lock n. This can be done in parallel. Once you have that, right? Once you have that, this part again is not done sequentially, so it's lock up n as well. The the whole thing here is lock up n multiplied by lock up n. That's why it's lock square of n. That's why it's lock square of n. Work is the same, so this is the same number. So basically, we have n lock n over lock n. Square, right? So parallelism becomes n over log of n, n over log of n, right? Okay, so this is good. This is actually greater than square root of n. Oh, why does this become uh, log square? So if you just, so this, this part is clear, right? Each box here is lock up n in the word, basically one single box here, the smaller span. So is that clear? Basically, we do partitioning in parallel. And when you do that, you can basically break into two sides, left and right, and left and right again, left and right again. So that's parallel. The second step is, if you look at this graph alone, what's the depth considering just these boxes? What's the depth of that? Lock up well four, right? It's lock up number of boxes, right? Basically, this is lock of number of boxes, right? Which is lock of boxes. How long is that box? What's the span of each box? Lock n, right? So you multiply the two number. That's why you get lock square n. Because you have lock of boxes. Each box is lock of n. So that's why it's lock square of n.
uh, it's, it's not literally the lock of the square. So each each box in the sense that the depth here, so the depth of this is lock of n, right? And there are lock of n steps. So it's lock of n steps from left to right, and each of the steps is lock of n. That's why you multiply the two numbers, it's not the lock of lock. My bad. Yeah. So yeah, so okay. Sorry about the the I think they use the 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 word that might sound confusing. Basically it's lock of n and each of the step here is lock of n. All right. That's why it's lock square of n. So how do we get that? Right? Uh well now we do the uh, partitioning and concatenation and we can have the uh, recursive call. So uh, at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, our work is n log of n. Our depth is now log square n, right? So parallelism now is n over log n. This is greater than square root of n. Great. So let's recap the whole thing again, right? Let's do the recap on the whole thing again. And how do we establish a way to design a good parallel program, right? So in terms of operations that you can do on a collection, remember our old friend correct collection, like linked list, array, vector, is map good for parallelism? Can I apply the map? You think so? And the answer is yes, right? Why? Can I do map on the first element along the same time as the second element, along the same time as the third element, along the same time as the fourth element? The answer is yes. It's super parallel, right? Map is the one of the function that's really, really, really easy to realize. Why is reduce good? Reduce means that I have a bunch of things in my collection. I apply the operation on each pair again and again and again and again. There'll be a figure to explain this, but we'll explain why are they good. Map is simple. Map apply, map apply a function to every single element. Reduce is a pairwise combine. Right, combine element in the tree until you only have one single thing left. And I'm going to show you what it means. Filter. Uh, filter is basically apply a function. And if the function is true, keep it. If it's false, return it. So let's go through them one by one. Map, as we said, what work? What is work and what is step? So let's say I have n elements. What's the work of the mapping? Work is all of n, right? And what is step? <clears throat> so everything can be done in parallel, right? So in that case, depth is one, right? All of one. So our parallelism is and this is really good, right? This is really good, as best as it can be, actually. How about reduce? Reduce something like this. I start with my array, my power collection. And reduce would apply, it would take a pair, basically pick each two elements, apply the function which in this case can be an add, right? So you add them together. Add, 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 add. Then now you have half of the elements, you do pairwise again. Let's say they're adding, right? Pairwise again, adding. You ended up with the results. So let's assume I do this pairwise addition. Let's assume I do this pairwise addition. What is the resulting of my reduce function? So what do I get at the end? If I want to add 
everything element pairwise. Summation, yes. Because like basically you are basically adding everything, right? Uh, although not not yet, but yes. The next question: What's work and what is that? So work is, yeah, depth is log n, yep. So to get work, right, if I have n nodes, if I have n nodes, can I make a guarantee on the number of nodes? Oh, my, my bad, if I have n, n, n elements in my collection if i have n elements in my collection let's say over here my collection has eight elements how many how many nodes do i spawn at the end yes right i basically spawn eight nodes so if you look at the number of addition here one two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? I'm basically have seven addition, so that's work. So work, if I have n elements, you end up with n operation, right? Because the number of operation you have to do is the summation of the node that you have spawned. In this case, you spawn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's gonna be n minus one, right? If it's a balanced binary tree like this, it's gonna be n minus one. So your work is O of n. Problem is n over log n. Again, good, better than square root of n, right? How about filter? Filter is a little bit weird. Right, because you apply the function, which seems easy. You apply the function that could be done in Trello, but you have to collect. You have to collect what you want to keep and what you want to throw out. Right. So the major challenge is how many are going to be selected and how to be retain the output. Right. So that's the key challenge with filter, depending on how you implement it, but it can be designed to be done in parallel. If you design them properly, right? The complexity just this time you can establish a, a, a clear complexity because it depends. It depends on what is being filtered. And the way you can go through filter and design a parallel algorithm, your data flow graph is a good idea. See what is the data dependency and make sure they're not dependent from the earlier elements. Earlier elements. So filter is a little bit of a challenge in the sense that that can be done, but you have to think about how you want to implement each of the filtering function. All right. So now let's go to the simple one. Example of using the map. All right in Rust, so this back to Rust, you want to call a map function, right? Self is the collection, right? Array vector list. As long as they are iterable, basically you can go through each of the elements, it's fine. You have your own, which is the collection, and a function that you want to apply to, right? 
So let's say if you want to do a flip of one to flip of 100, right? You can apply the map using this. So VV, VV is a vector that consists of fifth. This is basically fifth of my bad. You guys see? This is not fifth yet because we haven't called a function. Right now it's basically an array of one, two, three, four, blah blah blah, one hundred, right? And we want to apply map. We want to map Fibonacci to all these numbers. Right? So VV dot par eater go through this list of uh not this again my bad vector go through this vector of one two three four five blah blah blah, blah to one hundred at the same time in parallel map right you map the function Fibonacci let's assume we define the function Fibonacci somewhere else we map them you collect collect mean that once the data comes back I'm gonna return again a resulting vector so xx is going to be Fifth of one, fifth of two, fifth of three, blah, 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 fifth of 100. So that's xx. After you collect, you get the result. Oh, what else do we need to do? Okay. You can do fork join, right? When you have Fibonacci, you want to make sure when you implement Fibonacci, this fib of n, this fib of n is done this way. Right, this way. So make sure you do fork join when you do it. Uh, yeah, so you have a, there's a comment on the, on the chat saying, this sounds expensive to do 101 Fibonacci. Yes, uh, it is, it is. I'm not saying this is a great example, but it applied a map function on the Fibonacci function that we declared earlier. And the Fibonacci function that we declared earlier is done in a parallel way. Not the best way, not too bad. All right. How about uh, reduce? So you can use uh, Rayon's, uh, Rayon's implementation of filter, map, and reduce to perform parallel operations. So let's say I want to do parallel stuff, right? This is what I can do. Now, VV again is the vector of one, two, three, blah, blah, blah to this five. 50 million, right? 50 million. I want to sum them all, right? One, two, three, five to 50 million. And um, I don't know that I can calculate the sum of sorted number one, two, three to 50 million by just do n multiplied by n minus one, one. So I will do the sum by using reduce. The way you write it is, First of all, parallel iterator, again, don't forget that. And then dot reduce, dot reduce. Start with zero, start with zero and say, hey, this can be done in parallel. Put that double bar there. This is a function call. So A, my bad, let me write this clearly. So that it, A, B, this particular uh, text means that it's a function that takes A and B as an input. So this is basically your function call. It takes A and B as an input and perform A plus B. So that's how you can write a function in a short form inside Vast as well. Use this vertical sign, the vertical sign Whatever goes in there is the input to the function. Whatever go afterward is the function body. So over here is function that takes two input A and B. You add them together, return A plus B. Right. So how about filter? Let's say I want to remember our exam, uh, getting a prime number between 1 million to 20 million. Uh, it has been two weeks, so I guess you should remember that our is prime function. 
Oh, this, this is just for the sake of this example. It's one to 20 million. I think I forgot what number we have for the exam, but don't worry about that. It's if you if you put in a typo that get the, the prime between like 20, 10, 20 million instead of 10 million, I, I won't penalize you for that. Yeah, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, so is oh is that the number prime? Actually, not sure. <laughs> but the way we can find that is do that. So let's say I have the function called is prime. Basically, it's a check if n is prime, right? Uh, this function, the way it works is I'm gonna basically have n as an input. Right now, it's floating point. I calculate the square root convert that to an unsigned. And now I want to make sure that everything is a, is a prime number. It's a prime number. It's only if when you go through n, right? When you go through n as it uh, and c here. For all c, for all c constant between one, between one and n, you do n mod c is not zero. Basically, it's not divisible by anything from two to n minus one. Yeah, so about the number of primes, actually I forgot. <laughs> is there a way to approximate it? I actually don't know if you are a, a math like uh, uh, major, let me know too that I'm curious is, is that is that really the approximation? Because I actually I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I actually don't know the number. But if you want to write a function call, like first write the function is prime and then then you can do this. Uh, sorry about this auto annotation. It's basically I want to generate basically this generate number between 1 million to 20 million. I generate a number first, then call parallel iterator. Then you filter, use dot filter would perform the puke filter. And notice n is borrow, n is borrow is an input. I can modify n is prime n. Is prime n. The reason why n is borrow is because you want to make sure once you filter, oops, you can collect the result. Is it true or false? And you count the number. All right. So that's it for today's lecture. It might be a lot of new material. If you have a question, I realize we only have about 10 minutes left before I need to go teach the concept art class. Uh, so before we leave today, right, ask the following question, ask the following questions. We've been talking about parallel programming for a while, right, at least for two hours. It seems good, but think about what else can be serializing your program. For example, right, for example, are data being shared? Are data being shared? Another example is like, what if I have Fibonacci of 1,000? It would actually 1000 means that I have to calculate people of 999 and 998, right? So let's say this takes x seconds. This is y seconds. Which one is going to be faster? Is x greater than y or y greater than x? X is going to be way higher than Y, right? Fib of 999 will take a lot longer than Fib of 998. So it means that Fib of 1000, which go to Fib of 999 and Fib of 998, which then go to Fib of 998 and Fib of 997. Right, this is fifth of nine nine seven. This is fifth of nine nine six. 
which side of the tree would dominate the runtime? Which one? Is it the left side or the right side of things? Which one dominate this runtime? The left side, right? The left side would dominate this by quite a lot, right? If you think about it, what's our depth here? So what's depth? Yeah, the depth of this graph. I have FIP of 1000. Yeah, it's going to be 1000, right? Because it's going to go 1000, 999, 998, 997. You're not really reducing the work at all, right? So over here, Fibonacci is not going to be efficient because it's really, really left sided, right? It's going to wait for FIP of 999. FIP of 998 come back way earlier, right? It could be back way earlier. So this is when I said need to wait for all the threads because we have FIP of 999 on one side, FIP of 998 on the other side. The left side is going to take much longer, right? So sometimes we call this a scrappler's problem, right? Uh, it's like when you're running in a team, right? And everyone has to hit the finish line. So let's say I run in a team and the rule is everyone in my team has to reach the finish line. Who should I care between the fastest guy in my team or the slowest guy in my team? The slowest guy, right? Do I care about how fast the rest of the, the, the runner in my team? No, the slowest guy determine your performance <laughs> of your competition. Think of it that way. Parallel programming, don't forget the slowest guy because we typically call the slowest guy the critical path. That guy is so critical to performance because the rule, the rule in your computer when you run things in parallel is, is the team competition. We don't care who finished first, we care who finished last. So we want to make sure the slowest guy is faster, right? So to make things faster, to make things faster, do we train the fastest guy or do we train the slowest guy so that he or she is faster? The slowest, right? Until the next guy becomes the slowest, though in that case, we train another guy. The logic applies here. It directly applies. If you want to make the slowest part of your program faster. That's when you can see the difference. All right, guys. So it's a lot of new material today. Again, sorry about that. Uh, I think we have to kind of go through this high level first before you go into more details. And I apologize. I thought I would finish earlier. Uh, I fail. <laughs> Uh, so that's it for the class today. Uh, anyone have any question? I think this doesn't worth switching to Discord, actually. I'm going to stay on here on WebEx. And if you have a question, type in on the chat or turn on the microphone and you can ask me right now. I'll be here for maybe like six to seven more minutes before I need to switch to the Compass Art class at 2 p.m. Uh, so, but I'll be here. All right, so let me stop the recording. Uh, that's all for the class today. If you are 